hopefully what in this talk I will answer is what is Cascada? Not a lot of people have heard about it. I'll give you a run through on that. Uh, what is real-time AI? Um, what do I mean by that? I'm going to give a quick uh, demo of a RAG app. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I'll explain it and show you how we can uh, leverage AI in an app with five minutes of devel development time. And then I'm going to go through uh, open source and the importance of open source. A little bit about myself. I am a committer and on the PMC for Apache Cassandra. Last year, I was the PMC chair for the project. Uh, I've also been PMC chair for Apache Tiles, and I've been uh, passionate and involved in open source for a number of decades now. Um, I thought for this presentation that I would uh, uh, go back to my first patch, um, but then I realized I have no idea what my first patch in open source was. Uh, it could have been something to Bugzilla. It could have been a, a Linux driver. Um, otherwise, it was around the time that, that NetBeans was first open sourced and the, the NetBeans platform came out. Uh, at work, in my day job, I, um, I have been an engineer by training and at heart, uh, and I still tried to code uh, at least a day a week, or in my evenings, if I can, um, when the family lets me. Uh, but then I was a consultant for 10 years, uh, primarily on Apache Cassandra. That led me to work with some of the largest deployments in the world. Um, and then just this year, I've been moved into product. I'm still trying to figure out what product people do. Uh, but the position that I was put into was VP product open source, which is kind of odd because open, open source, especially what I'll talk about later, true open source, is not something that a company controls. Um, and that is something that product people often have trouble getting their head around. Um, and so my role is to kind of help uh, communicate how companies invest and contribute to an open source which is not controlled by them, how product works with that dynamic. Uh, so it's really more like open source operations. People will say, oh, is it OSPO, or Open Source Program Office? I don't like to think about it like that. I like to think about it more like operations, in that if all of the company's efforts and contributions and coordinations with open source and all of the other vendors and companies contributing to the projects is invisible, it's successful. So making it all off everyone's radar and just run smoothly is, is part of my job. A little bit more about the company that I work for. Uh, Datastax. Datastax is known for being uh, well, one of the big contributors behind Cassandra in the early days. Uh, we are no longer that. Apple is probably the biggest contributor now. Um, contributor of individuals contributing, I should say. Um, and uh, we also have uh, companies like Netflix and Intel and Amazon and Microsoft and uh, Instacluster and Avian or uh, offering up contributors into our community. What we do at Datastax is we offer Cassandra in the cloud. More than that, we offer a modern application layer data platform. And the key components that we see here that, that you need in a data platform in your application stack today are uh, the database, streaming, and machine learning. I'll go into a little bit more of that later. This is built on open source products. Uh, as a company today, our strategy is uh, we don't hold IP. We're not interested in proprietary versions of our open source products. Everything that we do is open source. Everything that we code, we open source. We give you the freedom to operate. So you can put these components together yourselves, or you can get us to operate it for you. Our job. Our mission is to be the best at operating this. Essentially, we are just a utility. Our job is not just to be good at operating it, but to run it cheaper and more efficiently than anyone else can, and that incentivizes you to take that off your shoulders. OK, so I'm going to break the talk up into four sections. Uh, Cascada, that's what you turned up for. It was on the title of the talk. 
And then I'm going to go through generally of AI and RAG apps, and then I'm going to talk about uh, real-time AI, bringing those two th things together, and then finally talk about putting it into production. So Cascada uh, was a startup a couple of years ago. It came from the ML engineers in Google. And they saw that the, the, the real missing piece and almost half of business value uh, to ML platforms was not the batch uh, training of models and, and then putting it in, into an ML platform, but actually more real-time stuff. And this has kind of opened up the doors to what we call feature engineering instead of feature stores and so on. They left Google, started a startup. Uh, and then last year, Datastax acquired them. And the first thing that we did was open source the project. So you can now find the project on uh, GitHub. It has lots of features. Uh, it's quite a mature product already, considering how young it is. I won't have time to go through all of them. On the feature list, probably my favorite is the native time travel. Um, for ML platforms, this is a missing piece for a lot of people's stacks. And with uh, regulation coming up, the need for accountability and auditing um, on ML platforms is going to hit a lot of people hard. Um, and Cascada does it very nicely and cleanly. OK, so jumping in, this is going to take us like back to basics, so excuse me. So, but if you think about a timeline to begin with, it is just discrete points on uh, a timeline uh, with some values grouped by entities. X-axis time, Y-axis, some value, entities grouped by color here. First thing that we want to do with that is aggregate it. So here we're just saying, what's the sum of each entity over time? So we're just taking it from a discrete timeline to a continuous timeline. Again, this is pretty traditional and general way to uh, visualize this type of data. So here the question for us is how much did each user spend over time? If we're going to do that in Cascada, you know, we can start somewhere, start somewhere basic. This is just we're taking the purchases and we're interested in the amount column um, of that object and we're summing it. And that's how you're going to get those values over time. What about if we want to window the aggregation? Again, this is not complicated. Let's say we're interested in how much has each user spent this month. All we do here is into the sum function, we pass in the window, uh, and we just say it's since the beginning of the month. Again, nothing complex, super simple. Here comes one of Cascada's tricks. What about if you want to do window aggregation but not based on time. So for each user, how, much, how many page views have occurred since the last time there was a purchase? So here you can see that we're looking at what were the page views and counting them, and then when there was a purchase, what was that value? In Cascada, we do that with, we're, just, we're first working with page views objects, we count them since there was a purchase. We can do this in SQL too. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is not something that I'd really uh, want to be handed off. If, if I was starting a new job and they were like, this is what we wrote, I'm like, help. So we don't want that. Okay, what about joins? What is the average product review or score at the time of a purchase. So here you can see we're interested in average review scores over time. And then when an item was purchased by someone. In Cascada, this is, we're taking the reviews object, we're interested in the score column. And now we want to associate that with a reviews object and its column item, taking the average, and then looking it up at that point when the purchase happened. Super simple. This is written in Python, one line. We can do an SQL too. It gets even more complicated. There's stuff in this that I didn't even know existed in SQL. Um, yeah, SQL can do everything. Just don't make me ever do that. Don't want it. 
it's not just SQL. Uh, people often say, oh, but uh, Spark Streaming can do this type of stuff. Well, we l went and looked up an existing implementation of uh, Spark Streaming uh, that did churn prediction over time. And we took 63 pages of Spark code and rewrote it in two pages with Cascada. So you can see when it comes to doing declarative reasoning over timelines, because Cascada is an abstraction layer or library that is built for doing this from the ground up. It used to have a custom DSL language on top called Fennel, and just a couple of months ago that was rewritten to be, or Python, native Python, um, just, just to meet developers and the audience where they are. The engine of Cascada is all written in Rust, and the data processing part of it is done with Apache Arrow. So that's going to take advantage of the GPUs where we can. So performance, everyone likes a benchmark for the value that it is, but we took a few examples. We compared it with DuckDB, which is known to be very fast um, for this type of stuff. And you can see that Cascada was consistently faster, and in some cases, an order of magnitude faster. So hopefully already you can start to see this is super simple, it's fast, and it's quite likely going to make things possible or feasible where they weren't before in your job, at your work, in your solutions. Okay, so jumping into the next section. Cascada was originally written with predictive ML in mind. So, you know, like with Cascada on an ML platform, an inference with an inference model, you could do something like, you know, within three or four clicks in a user session, you could pinpoint what the intent of their session was. So, for example, if they went into a retail website, you could say, is this user really going to buy something? Um, and what category are they going to buy? Or are they just browsing? Um, or, you know, like, so you'd be able to do those things quite quickly where that's typically not what ML platforms do. They can give you recommendations, but they're based on yesterday's data. 2023 hit, uh, GPT came out, everyone's product roadmap got wiped, uh, and everyone's like, hell, what are we going to do with AI, generative AI? Open up a whole new world of possibilities. And what we're seeing a lot of uh, happening is these RAG apps, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, I know with our customers across the US, there is just this mad rush to implement chat AI, or AI chat bots uh, before Thanksgiving. And they're basically following this architecture. So you've got, uh, you take all of your in-house data, all of your proprietary or in-house data, and you vectorize it or you create embeddings of it. You go put it into a feature store or a database which has a vector search. Then when a user comes along and asks a question, you vectorize that question or, or do an embedding on that question, and then on that vector, you do a vector search, you, that gets you uh, uh, um, close or nearest neighbor, what we call approximate nearest neighbor results for that question in your internal knowledge database or uh, um, in-house data or uh, that user session and all their history. It, it can be from multiple areas. But what you're doing essentially is then when you go to uh, write the prompt that you're going to uh, send to the GPT or your large language model. You have a prompt template, you have the original question from the user, but you're enriching that prompt with all of your in-house data that's a close match to the original question. Not only does this prevent hallucinations, um, it binds your large language uh, model answers to stuff which is your business domain or data domain. So let's go through this in a super quick example. And I'm going to try and do this in five minutes. Oh, not where I want to go over here. So if I jump into data stacks, 
And I'm going to use for this uh, Astra, which is our uh, Cassandra hosting in a cloud. Log in with my Google account. I've already created a database called RAG Chatbot DB. And the example that I'm, that I'm going to follow is, I just went, went back, I jumped over it, is this example here. So you'll find it quite quickly. Um, this takes us to a Jupyter notebook, which I've already got opened in a tab. Um, it's, it's, so I've created a database. Um, ready to go for us. I've created a key space ready to go for us. So let's get going. So is it connected? Yep. So first thing to do is need a few Python libraries. Get that going. I've already done it. Um, this is usually where my Wi-Fi decides to drop out. Um, but it's looking good. Import some Python libraries. The next step is to connect to the, Arta, to connect to the Astra database. I need a token. Um, we get that token by going to connect and then just generate token. And that will give you just a small JSON object. And one of the fields in there has this Astra CS. I've already got this, so I'm just going to uh, copy it. And then I'm going to get my open AI key. Uh, so if you go to platform, open AI, I've already logged in. You go to account and go to view API keys. I've already got an API key, so I'm going to just copy that. Okay. And then I've got a key space name. I already showed that. It's, um, it's here. Okay, uh, with a token, I'm just going to use the token user, which tells the the client to use the token-based approach. And then I'm going to need a secure connect bundle. So uh, this is a, uh, Astra comes with just a, a little zip file that contains the keys uh, to make connection easier. I've already downloaded that. Um, so I can. Just, that's, my, that's my connection bundle there. Good to go. To create the embeddings, I'm going to use the ADA02. Create a session. I've got that table in the database already. Drop it. Look like I did. Try again. Done. Dropped. Okay, so I'm going to create the table. The table we're going to create is an ID. That's just a UUID or something. The title of the document, the context of the question, the question being asked, and all the possible answers. So what I'm going to do here, you'll see here, I'm going to download the Stanford Question Answering Data Set or the Squad Data Set from Hugging Face. Um, and so this table model kind of uh, is a okay schema for, for that data set. And then uh, against each question and the, the different answers it has, I'm going to create this field which is just of a vector type of one and a half thousand dimensions. Okay, done. Download the data sets. 
again, most of this stuff is like stuff you do one-off, so it's not actually development time. The development time probably comes down closer to a minute. Okay, let's put it into a panda. Let's take a look at it. You can see the, the data there. Title, context, question, answers. I know that this data set has duplicates, so let's remove them. Okay, so now we're going to create an embedding for each question and put it into our Astro database. This will take about a minute, I think. Again, it's a one-off. Um, the next steps that we're going to do is, say for, that's, say for example, that's your, your internal data. Um, and then you've got uh, a chatbot, and the user goes into the chatbot, and they ask a question. So we're going to take that question here. When was the College of Engineering University of Notre Dame established? And then we're going to create an embedding of it. And then uh, with that embedding, we're going to put it into a SQL statement, which is selecting that table. And we're looking for results which are ordered by proximity to that vector, and just, just three. Um, and then what we're going to do, while that is still running, this is our prompt template. So we're going to create a prompt where the role um, or GPT, we're telling it you're the chatbot helping customers qu with questions. Uh, the user is asking this question. And then we have assistant content, and we're putting in uh, what we looked up to be our three closest internal questions. And then asking GPT 3.5. Let's see if I finish that. Done. Okay. So that's our vector that we created. I create the select statement. This looks like a vector, but it's actually, if I go to the top, <laughs> that statement. Let's find the three closest questions in our in-house data. So here we go, three questions related. Let's create that prompt and run it. And the answer is the College of Engineering at the University of Notre Dame was established in 1920. So five minutes, give or take, and you can see most of it was just set up. Okay, so moving on. Um, how do we bring these two things together? I mean, we see here in 2023, um, and with these RAG apps and generative AI, again, something very simple, very powerful uh, in our industry. Um, we know this. Uh, a lot of people are struggling to kind of figure out exactly how do I uh, use this in our business? Where's the value? And if you go to any local AI startups, uh, you know, the level of creativity I'm seeing in the startup community right now is phenomenal. I haven't seen anything like it. And I, at a few of those meetups, you'll meet all of your local angel investors um, and product people who are desperately looking for their uh, early cash and engineers. So it's all happening. But what about combining these two things together? We take a few example questions that we could ask uh, a bot. Um, you know, when will my package arrive? Or a recommendation, what should I watch tonight and why? Or financial assistant, is it a good time to, to buy Bitcoin? And you can, when you think about you know, how best to answer those questions, you can see that um, they often do touch on, on uh, real-time based information. You, you can't be working with yesterday's information. You can't be working with your, your database data at large, you're interested in what's happening in your streaming processes in your application stack as they happen. Let's take a, a bit more of a concrete example. Say, for example, in the Astra portal, we created a chatbot chat which was to help uh, operators and users of Astra database 
with their, with their database. And so here we have a, a user comes along and he's like, why are my queries so slow? And um, you know, with our in-house data, all of our you know, support documents uh, and support pages, you know, we could probably come up with a pretty good static answer. Hey, Ben, queries can be slow for many reasons. For example, the surface may be under heavy load, or your query may, be involved, may involve significant computational costs. Yeah, it's pretty lame, really. Um, that user was obviously doing something then and there, and the problem was related to their current session or today. So, if we take real-time context and we put that in there, we can say, well, you know, their average query in latency is about three milliseconds. We know that's their norm. And at the moment, they're seeing queries which are taking around seven seconds. And if we take a look at their recent queries, um, you know, we can see that uh, there's information, like we can see what they're doing wrong there. And we can say, hey, Ben, looks like your queries are doing full table scans. Um, try and select a key or, or use an index on that column if, if, if you're developing it. An example that I've got to run through is uh, that combines both these technologies is an example Genai is, a, is, is an app that we've got on GitHub. It's under the Cascada organization called Beep GTP. And the idea here is uh, to create a Slack bot which notifies you of messages or threads that are happening that you would typically be interacting with. Um, this should resonate with most of you, and at least personally, I find Slack more and more frustrating. The, the more uh, accounts that I'm in, the, the more channels there are at work, like there are hundreds of channels. Now, I mean, like to try and actually stay on top of it, you're spending half an hour every day just scanning through, trying, trying to get all the threads read. Um, it's impossible. Really great way of just bringing you to the messages as they happen. So what are we going to do here? Um, we're going to take a uh, export dump of our Slack account, and we're going to put it into Parquet files, and then we're going to create timelines of all the messages and all the threads over all the channels. And then we're going to, in a predefined format, put them in uh, to prompts, which are, uh, and then do fine tuning um, into a, a GPT uh, account. Fine tuning isn't something you typically need to do from what I've seen so far. 90% uh, of the time, uh, playing with your prompts will get you what you need. But there are a few use cases here and there where fine tuning is, is the right thing to do. Here, because the kind of the, the structure of, of the data that we're working with um, uh, is so specific, it, it, it makes sense. What that then allows us to do is that we then create a Slack bot that listens to messages and it will recreate them in that same predefined format and put them in as a prompt um, and then the response from GTP, GPT will be, these are the people that it would typically be responding to this thread or message. And then you can go send a notification to those people. If you go to that GitHub project, it's really only two files. Uh, we have an example export a dump uh, for you if, you, if you just want to play around. Um, not everyone has admin access to uh, Slack accounts. And then the fine-tuning notebook is just that, that top half of the diagram, uh, transforming the data into parquet files, putting it into timelines, then putting each uh, thread into predefined format, and then feeding it into OpenAI for the fine-tuning. And then this beep GTP Python file, which is the Slack bot that listens. Uh, okay, read me. You, I think I've explained that already, I hope. The key part in the, find, in, the, in the notebook is this section here. Again, it's super simple, but the messages, we're just basically trying to uh, key them and join them on the channels and the threads. And in the peep, beep GDP file, which again, I think it's like 100 lines of Python or 200 lines of Python, it's very small. 
the main function is this one, um, which is handles conversations and the conversations hand comes in. It does exactly the same thing. That's our predefined format. That is the temp. Th that is the prompt that goes in, um, and we get the answer for. Okay. So, whole new world of possibility. Uh, we can do lots of cool stuff with this. Um, I think this year what we've seen is, an, and the data scientists are a bit shaken up, and they should be, the democratization and the commoditization of data science and machine learning. You can see here now that any old developer can come along and do quite complex machine learning or AI types of stuff in a few lines of code. This is great for us, uh, but this possibility is open to everyone. It's what everyone is streaming ahead with this year. What about when it, you put it into production? And I think this is where people are going to hit the hurdles. Development has now been made very simple. Once you're in production, I think that's where we're going to find our challenges, and it's certainly what we're seeing already with the people who are deploying these apps. First up, how do we see the application stack changing? Um, we're seeing more and more the, the data tier as the critical foundation in every application stack. Um, if you ask me, I would say that the definition of digitalization and digitalization projects this year has fundamentally changed. Last year, digitalization was about the automation of processes and tasks. This year, digitalization is simply about getting analog data digital under one data control plane one data platform. You need your data to be democratized, access to all of its consumers under one governance plane, one access plane. This is data mesh in a way. Um, maybe a better term that I've heard is data-centric engineering. Everything on top, okay, so we're, you've seen now I've used different integrations, um, different frameworks to, to kind of uh, set up. But I think what we're seeing with the business logic and with the user experience is it's becoming very cheap. Now, we haven't seen um, uh, kind of many autonomous agents, AI agents, come out yet. And this notion of, you know, you can just go to a, to, to a GPT and say, uh, here's my um, product specification with an engineering specification with you know, these are how I want you to test it and do chaos testing and security testing and privacy testing, just doing all of those specifications to GPT and say, write me that program. Um, but a lot of people are pretty confident that's where we're going and going quickly. So all the, top, all the, st the, the stuff on top is becoming very cheap and very automated. Um, simple and quick to change. What's not quick to change is the stuff on the bottom. And what a lot of people don't have is a proper data platform in the application stack that will scale. What I think we're going to see is what happened in 2010 with mobile first and the explosion of data and how it blew up anyone's hope of using an RDMS system in data warehouse or data laking or analytics. We're seeing that going to happen in the application stack. And so you are going to now start to replace the legacy databases, the RDMS systems, with modern data platforms that can serve any consumer, no matter what format or API or traffic shape or SLOs they require. That is why at Datastacks, uh, we have built this data platform. That is what we're trying to deliver to people. We are active in the open source community. And the things that we're working on, uh, you can find Astra and Cassandra uh, plugins to Langchain. Uh, there's also this Langstream project that's come out, which allows you to, I think, more in a lighter way, do s a streaming approach, uh, alternative to Langchain. Uh, we have Stargate, which is like a coordinator 
layer on top of a Cassandra cluster that gives you REST and gRPC and GraphQL and uh, document APIs. So again, uh, your data can be accessed by anyone. And we've got this CASA.io uh, framework, um, which uh, um, helps people put Langchain or Lama Index onto Cassandra. And lastly, not least, we've got one of our engineers is working on this JLama, uh, which is a um, Lama Index um, rewritten into Java. And he's already getting uh, an order of magnitude better performance um, in Java, which is kind of like blowing him away. I don't have the reasonings to that. It could just be a cleaner design. Who knows? I know he's now relying on JDK 21. OK, bringing it back to Apache Cassandra, I think you've kind of seen where I've tied this into the loop and that uh, you know, the data platform, we need, to take a different, we need to take different approaches. This is just one technology that you could be implementing in a data platform. And when I talk about a data platform, I'm not saying you can just go take your RDMS technology and go replace it with some other database like Apache Cassandra. A data platform today requires lots of different components put together. One of the things I want to touch, about, touch on, though, is the NoSQL moniker. So the NoSQL moniker came from one of the committers in the Cassandra project. And it's kind of been misinterpreted along the way. When the moniker was first um, mentioned, what it meant was, look, we're taking a monolith database, the RDMS systems, and we're going to rewrite them into microservices. Now, microservices wasn't a word back there, back then. Um, distribu distributed computing is a better idea, but microservices people understand. And databases are some of the most complicated technology in our industry. So we knew that, that we wouldn't be able to replicate an RDMS's uh, feature set in one year or two years or three years. We had to start somewhere. And we understood that, that, well, sometimes you can shard a petition data in the application layer if your data domain, data domain naturally shards that way. Um, but it's more often than not a dead end. And if we could do that petitioning for you, uh, that was the, the, the longest path in the future. The problem with that was that we had to break relationships. And so that's where NoSQL came from. NoSQL was about that journey about rewriting a complex piece of technology into distributed commuting, computing. Unfortunately, other databases came along, like MongoDB. It's a great database. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to diss it. Um, but they were like, oh, look, well, we've got a database too, and it's got a different interface than SQL, so we're NoSQL too. And so that's kind of led us into this trap that NoSQL means about the user interface, that you, you have a different feature. And it's also kind of led us down the wrong path, I believe, that every time you have a different, uh, a need for a different feature in your data, you think you need to go choose a different database. What we're doing with Cassandra is uh, implementing vector search. We did that in four days. We got feature, feature parity with Pinecone with one developer coding in four days. We have performance both latency, relevancy, accuracy, uh, and throughput, double that of Pinecone. Half latency, double throughput. Um, and we understand that the people who can keep their data at their source of truth and just create the embeddings or the vectors there, they don't need to copy data to a search engine, they don't need to copy data to the analytics platform, etc. Um, are going to win. It's not just the cost of savings with storage, it's the cost of savings of moving that data and massaging it, or having to uh, work with yesterday's data and different schemas. Um, like organizationally, every, everything is much simpler. That was that slide. I think I'm up for time. Uh, lastly, I want to note, uh, in December, we have a Cassandra Summit in San Jose. The Next Foundation is hosting it. Uh, please come and join us there. As you can see from this slide, Cassandra 5 is coming out with a ton of new features. We have uh, ACID compliance. We're now strictly serializable uh, at the spanner level. 
we can do leaderless uh, global strict serializability using commodity clocks with a single round trip. That is the Accord Consensus Protocol that came out of Apple. Um, vector search, unified compaction strategy, tries uh, throughout our structure. Thank you. If you've got questions, find me outside. Um, there's also these cards on the poster outside. You'll find these cards. Grab one. They've got the QR code, so you can um, log into Astra easily uh, and give it a whirl. Uh, if you want to try any of these things, it comes with a lot more examples. So I started with just the basic examples. There's a lot more there if you want to check them out.